Well, just as everyone's arriving, um, just a little, so I'm going to um, start out. My name is Lauren Heffron. I am the director and founder of Chacuzco Patico. And uh, we have uh, traditionally have uh, 32 years of European bicycle tours uh, going. Um, this year was, a, last year was a little bit different. Uh, we basically couldn't go to Europe. So I got real excited about um, operating some tours domestically. And I started right from my hometown of Key, New Hampshire where I grew up and, um, and started designing a trip of, of Southern New Hampshire. Um, and in Harrisville, of course, it has, was always on one of my weekly rides when I lived, um, lived in Keene as a kid. Um, so I started developing um, this trip in Southern New Hampshire. We have a lot of other domestic bike tours going, some in Vermont, the Adirondacks, uh, Maine. Uh, we have some tours in South Carolina and, and we have a trip out West. Um, so we have about 14 different uh, domestic bicycling tours. Um, and in the chat line, I will put um, some links to those trips. So you know, if you wanted to uh, just jot them down and then we'll be sending a follow-up tomorrow with additional links about these tours and, and some other things that are coming up um, next week and the following week. We have a cooking lesson and we have, um, we have um, my friend Richard Freeze is gonna talk about training for cycling. So every Friday we have the Chiclismo show and um, we've had a lot of great events. This is really unique um, with Suzanne. It's very, very, very niche and very, very different. But um, I wanted to tell the story about how I, um, I literally spun upon her I was uh, scouting my trip in Southern New Hampshire, uh, and I, I, I've done this road a thousand times, and I rode by, and all of a sudden, I saw these beautiful colored bo um, wooden boxes, sort of, I didn't even know there was, I, at the first glance, I didn't even know it was an apiary until then I saw the sign for her apiary. And uh, jotted it down, took a picture, got home, um, and, you know, Googled her and looked her up. And um, called, gave her a call. And I, you know, of course, the first thing we started chatting about was where we went to school and she went to Keene High School and I went to Keene High School. Uh, we were in school at the same time, but um, I probably met her and she probably met, met me, but we didn't necessarily recall, but we have a lot of mutual friends. So we quickly bonded um, our love of New Hampshire and our love of nature. Um, and I got real excited because um, all of our Chiclismo Classico trips are really, in, in addition to being a beautiful bike tour, uh, we really love to just have a lot of local stops along the way, food stops, wine stops, nature stops, walking tours. So for me, it's very important. Um, the bicycle is a means in by which we discover um, the most beautiful places in addition to sort of um, connecting with the local people. And Suzanne um, is basically uh, a permanent fixture to our <laughs> Southern, Ital Southern Italian, Southern New Hampshire bicycle tour. Um, and so we stop there on our second day. We ride from Keene um, up to Sullivan, to Nelson, to, Her to Hancock and, and Harrisville. And we stop with uh, Suzanne at Suzanne's apiary. And we did that three times this year and people love yes. her. Uh, <laughs> it was a great, uh, we have one, one, of her, one of her devoted fans online now. And uh, we had a, it was really fascinating. You know, of course, bees are, are, are amazing. And, um, and what Suzanne does is amazing. And her story has some parallels to mine. So um, I'll let her, you know, take it away and, and, and share a little bit more. But we're, we're real excited to um, have this little talk about bees because they really are such an important part of our, our world um, and our future and our ecosystem. So take it away, Suzanne. Okay, hello everyone. I'm sorry you can't see a picture of me. I'm technically um, not so great at this stuff. And plus our internet out here in Harrisville is not the best. So you'll just be hearing my voice through it. But just so you know, have a picture of what I look like. I, I popped one in there. So as, as Lauren said, uh, she just called up and I said, sure, because I had people to come visit my apiary all the time because it's very different from what you do in, um, in the typical way of keeping bees in America. So her tour goes into Harrisville first. So I'm gonna start with a little bit about Harrisville because it's a fascinating village and then we'll move to, to my apiary. So Harrisville is, is one of many water powered mill towns along the, the, uh, the, in, within New England, but it's the only one that has remained intact in its original state. Okay, sorry, that's blurry. I guess the bigger screen, it makes it a little bit blurry. Um, so for 150 years, the textile industry provided a livelihood for this town and it operated from 1852 to 1970. And then it went belly up, but the town and the um, preservationists decided they did not want Harrisville to 
fall into disrepair and and to have be modernized or or ruined because it's such a such a unique village. So they developed the historic Harrisville Society. And back in 1977, the Department of Interior designated Harrisville a National Historic Landmark. So the entire center of Harrisville, you cannot change or you know do something stupid like put a McDonald's in there or anything like that. So one of the main centers of, the, of Harrisville is the general store, which you can see has been around since 1838. So this is an old picture. I'm not exactly sure what the year is on this. If, except for the stairs on the left and uh, the car there, the rest of it pretty much looks the same. And this, this I actually remember because back in 1971, when my parents bought this house in Harrisville, there were the two gas pumps in front of the store. And there was the phone booth there. Those, of course, are all now gone. Um, that's blurry again for the inside. Sorry about that. So the store, the inside looks very different now. Um, they do a lot. They do lunches. They do dinners on Friday night. They do a lot of specialty, specialty things and events, which is really nice. And a lot of people that come to visit my apiary, I send them to Harrisville store to have lunch. So Harrisville also has, because it was a, a um, textile mill, they have continued with in the same realm with Harrisville designs. And in the retail store, you can buy the yarns and looms. They do uh, loom classes. They have a boarding house. They're using all of the old mill buildings are being used today for businesses for historic Harrisville or privately renting offices. Um, several artists are renting some of the space. This is one of the loom rooms. And now, uh, two years ago, it's back to being power operated. They got the mills going again. There also was a, the railroad that went through, it was the Manchester Keene Railroad line that started in 1878 and they had four passenger trains uh, daily going over this. And then in 1893, it was taken over by the Boston Main Railroad. So the railroad actually runs right behind my house. It used to anyways. And this line that was here went from Maine to Boston. But back in 1934, the line was not making any money. And so back in 1934, they ripped up the lines. So there's some of your group right there. It's gorgeous in the fall. It's absolutely stunning in the fall with the little pond there. And the, there's a couple of churches, the building to the left there in the back is a library. And this is your group leaving Harrisville to head over to my place. So the, the, where I live is called Chesham. It used to be called Pottersville. There you are. <laughs> so in Chesham, we have the Chesham Depot. And this is literally right around the corner from me. And it was, a, they had a, um, uh, an earth a, for pottery. It was called Pottersville because they had several pottery places. And there was a field called Great Meadows. And back in the late 19, uh, 1800s, they dammed it up and now it's Chesham Pond. So my company is called Slovenian Beekeeping. I uh, have been a beekeeper going into my 11th year. And my interest in this is because I used to live in Slovenia for one, but I was not a beekeeper at the time. This is the barn that you would drive up to on your bikes or drive in the car to visit my apiary. And I did the typical American style of beekeeping, but on, on my many trips back to Slovenia, I just decided I just had to do the beautiful bee houses. And a man named Mark um, Simonich started this company back down in Cape Cod in 2014. And he and I hooked up together and he was in his 70s and decided he did not want a new business. And so he gave the business to me and I've been running it ever since. So these are what I call my barn bees. 
just because they're upstairs in the barn. Uh, the bee houses in Slovenia are very, very colorful. One of the big attractions of these is that there's no lifting to them and it makes it possible to do beekeeping for people who are handicapped or older or do not have the upper body strength. Also children can do this too. So throughout my presentation, if I see a picture of a bee, I'm going to insert some bee information. <laughs> for those of you who are not beekeepers, who might find some of these things very interesting. So this is the upstairs inside the barn. All of the work is done from the back. And so you're just lifting out one frame at a time and I'll show you that when we get to my other bee house. So one thing you may not know about bees is that a bee basically only lives about four to six weeks in the summertime. And during her lifetime, she will only produce one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So you can imagine how many bees it takes to fill up the pound of honey. So for two for a two and a, for two point two pounds of honey, bees would have to fly around the world the equivalent of three times. So this is part of the old railroad that runs behind the house. And I'll take you on the tour that I do with the bicycle group. So it's just, it'll be in the same order that I do with them. Uh, this is what I call my, my trellis area. It's a great place to have that glass of wine in the evening. Or if you're really tired after beekeeping, you can chill out. These are the hives, these are Langstroth hives. These are what I used to have. And in place of that now, Oh, another bee fact, let's see. So beekeeping goes back to 4,500 years ago. And they also were, the, back in ancient Egypt, people actually paid their taxes by using honey. I wish I could do that now. Mm -hmm. So this is my current bee house. The colors actually, I'm gonna point that out because it was a lot of work to repaint all of these. So these are the old colors. And those are my new colors. Kind of hard to pick them out with just a picture, but I love the new colors much, much better. So the panels on these are replicas of panels from the 1800s. The beekeepers in Slovenia would paint these. They were, there are 600 known panels. They're political, they're traditional, they're religious. And back in the 1800s, of course, the people were illiterate. So they would tell stories by, by doing these panels. So I decided to decorate my mine with panels of, of the life of farming and, and making, making meat or, or uh, doing the beekeeping part. So honey is, another fact, honey is the only food that contains all the necessary nutrients to sustain life. Most people probably don't realize how, how many honey contains the minerals and vitamins and trace and, and trace amino acids, trace minerals. And 90% of wild plants and 75% of all global crops depend on pollinators. And honeybees are not the best pollinators, pollinators, but they are certainly one of the most popular pollinators. So this is the inside of my bee house. And this shows you that you're just work, you're working from inside. All the lower hives, I can sit down and I can work my hives, the upper ones I can stand. And the nice thing about And the nice thing about this is that you're only lifting one frame at a time. Whereas with the Langstroth system, when you have to pick up one of those boxes, it can weigh anywhere from 40 to 90 pounds. And that's 100% back. You really can't use your knees when you do that. So many people have taken off with using these, the Slovenian Aje hives, because you don't have to do any lifting. And it's just lifting up one frame, which maybe at the most weighs seven pounds. So it makes it doable for everyone to do. This is my counter area. Most of my little things in here are all from Slovenia. And this last week, 
I had a visit from a diplomat from the Slovenian embassy in Washington, DC. This is Baru and his son, Adam. And they, they're up on my bed. I have a bed on top of my hives where I sleep with my bees. And his son has now decided that he wants bees so that he can sleep with his bees too, even though they are not beekeepers. He was very curious about going into seeing what the bees are doing inside. So one of the cool things about bees, this is pollen, they, they call the pollen sacs, that bees have to, bees have to visit between, they, between 50 and 100 plants on each time they fly out from the hive. So they go to each plant and they collect all the pollen they can and they turn in these pollen sacks and they bring them back to the hive and then another bee will take them off the, this bee so this bee can go back out and collect some more. So in the winter time, luckily this was not this winter, but one of the other benefits of this style of beekeeping is that your hives are protected from the elements and they don't get snowed in or don't, they don't get buried like they would with, uh, with the Langstroth ones. So from here, then we're walking, the railroad bed is behind this building. Now we're walking in front. And this is my new trellis for my kiwi plants. And I have a nice hammock in there for the summer. Actually, I don't get to stay at, lay in there as much as I would like to. And those, the, the bushes here in the front are St. John's wort. And the bees go absolutely insane over St. John's wort. They love it. There's thousands of bees on those things. And my garden has got a lot of plants and things that the bees would pollinate. I have 11 raised beds for vegetables. I also have the bees love the poppies. They go really, they, they're in them like, like they're insane. So the bees have what they call a waggle dance. Well, they come back, they'll go out and they'll find a great place for a source of food. And they'll come back and they'll do this dance and it tells the other bees exactly where to find this, what direction, um, how far to go. And I mean, it's amazing that they can do this with just this, what they call this waggle dance. And you can, if you're watching the bees on the landing board, you can watch them do this sometimes. So this is my garden kitchen. I think this is where the real fun began on the bike trip. Because in my garden kitchen, um, it is, is a completely fully stocked kitchen. I have my honey liqueurs. So this is something that when you go uh, to Slovenia and you visit a beekeeper, you will be greeted with a shot glass of a honey liqueur. And for all that, I go over twice a year. So I was always bringing back, don't tell anybody, bringing back bottles and bottles of this stuff. And I finally talked to somebody who gave me the recipe and it was so darn simple. I decided to make my own. So now I don't have to bother bringing back bottles of it anymore. So for those of you who are interested, the recipe is very simple. It's um, five liters of vodka, two and a half liters of honey and one liter of tea. And by tea, that means it could be anything that you want it to be. You look in the back, you see I've got one that says juniper and hops. Uh, the one to the right is lavender. The one in front of the lavender one is, um, is a dried fruit tea. And then the one to the left is orange and elderberry. And uh, mentioned, and what was mentioned in the advertisement for this was the uh, Jägermeister which is a recipe from my neighbor in Slovenia and her name is Janja. So this one is called Janja Meister. And I made it last year. It's got 39 ingredients of flowers, roots, um, herbs that I collected. And I'm slowly trying to get as many as I can in my garden. The, um, I've already started my next batch for this year. You, you add stuff into this big five and a half gallon uh, carboy and then in January, you strain it, you add honey, a little bit of water, and then you can start drinking it. And I have to say, this stuff is really, really good. And as I recall, everybody didn't have just one sample of this. It was more like two or three samples of this. And some were even the same of the same one because they liked certain ones over the other one. 
So now after that, we move to my bee store, which is in the barn. And I import all of my um, Slovenian beekeeping equipment from Slovenia. So it's the traditional equipment. And I have, I have everything in the store that and unfortunately now with COVID, I can't ship stuff anymore. So it's basically only on pickup only. And these are my honeys that I sell. But what I do with the tour group is that I have several different kinds of Slovenian honey. And so we do a tasting of that because most people don't realize that honey, depending on, on how you collect it, it takes on the flavor of what the bees collect. So in Slovenia, I have collected uh, 15 different types of honey. So this is what we're doing here using the little sticks and try. So I, I, after I give you a little bit of a high with the honey liqueur, now you're really gonna have a sugar high with the, with the honey. So I think we tried uh, six different kinds of Slovenian honey and four different years of my honey, which of course every year is, is very different from the year before because the flowers change. So the honey from June to July are two different honeys because there's different flowers that are open during that time. So after this, everyone gets ready and they kind of head out to the next, to your next destination. Suzanne, did you want to talk a little bit about um, when I visited you or we talked on the phone, you and I think with the groups, you also um, were talking a little bit about like the traditions in Slovenia, um, more, more reasons as to why, you know, the, that box, that, met, the, met, that methodology, like the, the movement of them or so forth with the van. I was trying to remember the whole. Oh, story. I see. No. Yes, I see. So one of the reasons that they developed this, this type of system with these hives is that they wanted to make them more mobile. So I should have popped a picture of that in there. Anyways, a lot of, there's a lot of transportation systems in Slovenia with B buses, with B trucks, B stands. And because Slovenia has so many different niches of different um, um, nectar flows, like you'll have um, chestnut, there'll be acacia, there'll be ivy, and so they, they, they happen at different times during the summer. So they'll take the trucks, say, to do this one. And then they'll, all the frames are empty. The bees fill the frame with that flow from the acacia tree. Then they'll go and they will extract all that honey out of the frames, put the frames back in, and then they'll go to the next one. Um, so several, each beekeeper could, could produce, depending on which parts he goes to, can produce three, four, five, six completely different tasting honeys. And the nice thing about these hives is that you have each of the frames are put into place with a metal um, spacer bar. So they can tighten those down with bars in the back. So when they're moving these on trucks, that the frames are not being, the bees are not being bounced all around on the inside. Mm -hmm. And then um, when you were giving us a tour of the, in, of the actual, you know, the, the inside, you were talking about all the different, um, you know, the different kinds of, like you cleaning out the boxes and the different kind of bees. I mean, you could talk a little bit about, um, I, I'm again, I'm trying to remember the whole tour, but it was fascinating <laughs> the way you were describing each of the boxes and what you had to do. And you're talking about um, that there's some bees that are actually, they, they, they take the dead bees away and like all the different, I mean, some of right. we've all heard, watched enough PBS programs to talk about, you know, be all the bee rolls again, but it's, it's fun. If it's fascinating every single time. So if you can yeah. talk a little bit about that. Well, the bees, the, there are three different, there's the queen and only one queen in the family. The drones are the males and the worker bees are the females. And sorry guys, but the worker bees, the females do everything. They do all the work in the hive. The men are basically around for fertilization. They have come up, they, they do a few other things, but the, but the females pretty much do everything. So, so the, there, are, there are what they call cemetery bees that will haul the dead bodies out from the inside. Bees are very, very hygienic. They're very clean, they're very organized and they don't like a messy home. So they all have their jobs. 
you have the nurse bees that take care of all the young larvae. You have the attendants that take care of the queen. The queen is completely taken care of by the other bees. She doesn't have to do anything but lay eggs and she can do up to 2000 a day. So she keeps quite busy just doing that. So her attendants take away the waste, they bring her food, they bring her water, they clean her and they make sure she's very happy because if the queen's not happy, the family's not happy. There are also guard bees. So they, they protect the entrance of the hive so that if other like yellow jackets or wasps try to get in, they will fight them off. And then their last their job is forager. And that's why the bees don't live very long because they, they basically wear out their bodies foraging. And they can fly up to, they basically will stay within about three mile, three or four mile radius of the hive. And they're visiting on every flight, they're visiting 50 to 100 flowers. So, and they bring it back in, unload it, and they go back out again. So you always have, with the queen laying 2,000 eggs a day and the bees dying off after four to six weeks, there's a constant regeneration of, of the hive. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And can you also, can you speak to the, like the different colors of the boxes and what, I mean, other than them being very pretty, I mean, you could, does it have some kind of function with the bees? And the, and bees the actually recognize color. Bees recognize color, they recognize shapes. So I try not to have the same, well, I mean, there, you'll see several bee houses that have are just two colors, but they also recognize location. So if you had a red hive on the top left and a red hive on the bottom right, then they would know that their house is on the left or on the right and it's up above or it's down below. Mm -hmm. So the colors are a way for the bees to find their way back home and the designs, people have come up with some wonderful, wonderful designs, um, is also a way for people, for, for the bees to find, to recognize where they do belong. But the queen gets off a pheromone. So she has, a, each queen has a particular smell to her. And, the, and her bees will know that, that that's their queen and that that's their home. Hmm. And um, can you speak a little bit as to um, like the, the different flowers that you have around where you are and, you know, in, Harris, in Harrisville compared to other places? Is there anything in particular or, or what do you um, have in abundance? I don't think there's anything particular here compared to probably other parts of, of New Hampshire. You can always, you can easily go on and Google um, um, bee friendly plants in New Hampshire or Maine or wherever it is that you live and start in, in, and start planting those. Whenever I find a bee on something, I go and buy more of it because yeah. I want to provide as much food for my bees as I can here. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I also uh, would like to say that I do not spray anything on my property. I use nothing. I don't use any pesticides, Roundup, nothing, because mm -hmm. that is just, it's, it's just not very healthy for the bees. Mm -hmm. um, it's not healthy for anything, actually. So my, my garden is organic. They, some of the things they, they love, um, the first snowdrops are the first things that they'll um, get nectar from. And then mm -hmm. dandelions. Bees like dandelions. So don't run over your dandelions to the lawnmower until after they start wilting and then you can sure. mow. I actually, if you walk through my garden during dandelion time, you'll see I mow around batches of them. Huh. And then when, they, when, they're, when they're gone, and then, I, then I mow the whole thing. But we also have a 19 acre field behind us that's full of dandelions. So they're not really lacking dandelion food around here. We have um, Michael Sanfilippo who will be doing, whom he and his wife Regina Ardigone will be doing um, a presentation next week on Puglia cooking. Um, but he mm. had asked a question, when building a Slovenian bee building, what compass point is optimal for the hive side? The hive should direction. be facing, oh, I'm sorry, the but, hive should be facing south, south, southeast. Southeast? So, south, southeast. But you want the, the, the front of these particular hives are double walled, so they're insulated. So if they're facing the sun in the morning, it warms the hive up. As opposed to if, if they didn't get any sun, then they, they might, they won't, they won't fly as much. They won't fly until they're warm enough to fly, mm -hmm. which is basically around 45 degrees. So the morning sun really warms up the front and my, my uh, bee house bees, that's my phone, I'm sorry. Um, 
the bee house bees will fly before my barn bees do. Hmm. And so, um, so is, each, is each hive a separate colony? Each hive is a separate colony, or as in Slovenia, they call them separate fam they, they call them families. Hmm. And each hive is a separate one. Right now, I went into the winter with 13, I came out with 12. So I did incredibly well this year. Okay. Last year, I lost uh, 60%. And what causes the loss? Just the cold? It, it can be many different things. I'm not sure what I did differently last year from this year, but a lot of different things can cause it. The, the hive can be too small to keep themselves warm in the winter. Um, if there's not proper ventilation, then it causes moisture in the hive. And if you have moisture in the hive and it get, uh, the moisture can also kill the bees if they don't have enough honey. If they, um, if they can't get out to fly during the winter time, this winter was pretty difficult for them actually. I was surprised mine did so well because from de mid, mid December until March, they could not fly. So bees do not like to go to the bathroom in their hive. So they hold it for two and a half months. <laughs> they literally did this this winter. And if they can't hold it, if they can't get out to fly and they can't hold it and they have to go inside the hive, then you end up with diseases you know, dysentery and things like that from the bees. So th there's a lot of things that, that regardless of how you keep bees, the same things can kill bees, but probably the biggest one is Varroa mites, which came over from Asia in the 1980s. And hmm. if you have bees, you have mites and, and they're, you have to control them because the mites will, will decimate your hives faster than anything else will. Um, Michael has another question. He says, on the average, how many bees make up a colony? Oh, um, well, I would probably, a small hive would be around 10,000 bees. And a large hive could be, uh, it depends. The, the way I keep bees, there's only two sections. There's the upper deep and the lower deep. So I can't have as many bees as, say, a Langstroth hive that you have box on top of box on top of box. And then you could, you know, have hundreds of thousands of bees in there. But I would say probably a decent size hive for me is probably maybe 50 to 70,000 bees in each hive. Mm -hmm. And, and um, something about Slovenian beekeeping that makes it more production and productive because of its method of, um, you can move the bee, you know, you can move the hives from one place to another. Can you, is, is that, is that? Um, I, don't, I don't think that makes, I don't think that makes a difference. They have the same problem with the varroa mites that we do. So um, unfortunately, we, we'll, we're we stuck with that forever. But they, the Slovenian hives protect them from the elements, which is nice. And they also can share the heat amongst themselves, box next to box. So they're not just out in the field somewhere where you, they get buried in snow or, or they, um, they can get, they, they could, they're not, if they're not properly taken, it depends where you live. If you live in a very, very cold place like Alaska, the people up there that have bee houses are heating their bee house. If you live in Louisiana, then you're putting um, temperature control air conditioning in your bee house. So it just really depends on, on, where, on where you live as to how you manage it. But the nice thing about bees is that, is that they just, it's a, it just seems like a much nicer way to keep bees because you're not taking off the top and, and bothering all of the bees because you're only taking one frame out at a time. Mm -hmm. So you can do this very, you do it very slowly. And most of the bees will just stay right on the frame. Some of them will get out in your bee house, but you have an escape window for that reason. Mm -hmm. And so I'll leave the window open. And then when it gets dark, the bees will, will go back out and go back in from the front, back into where they live. And then I can close the window. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's just, and plus working inside a bee house is just so much nicer. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do, a lot of people are doing many different things. They have extract, extracting rooms in their bee house. They're using them as guest houses. Um, I know one woman, she had her bee house down below and her craft room was upstairs. So there's lots of, lots of different things you can do with it. I think uh, until people actually see one, they don't, they don't, it's hard for them to visualize it. So people are, I have people that come every week to visit me. So anybody that's listening, if you would like to come and visit, you're more than welcome to. So why Slovenia, I mean, why, why did Slovenia become so, you know, the bee, you know, beekeeping 
Central capital of Europe. I know. I, I, I really don't know. I think part of it was, was the fact that um, uh, one of the beekeepers became, Anton Schuster's became a beekeeper for Maria Theresa in Austria. And so even though he was illiterate, he went to the court and he became her, the court's beekeeper. And that probably made it um, more, um, uh, what do I want to say, more popular with people because the royalty now was interested in beekeeping and they were interested in giving classes and he wrote several books. And then when he came back to Slovenia, it just, he, he, he continued doing the teaching and it just built from there. Mm -hmm. Even though they were, they've, they've been doing beekeeping way before that, but I think maybe he probably is the one that, that made it even more popular. The earliest recorded bee houses from the 1500s. Hmm. I was reading that one out of every 200 people is, um, is, a, is a beekeeper. Is a beekeeper in Slovenia. That's true. And they also have a very, uh, it's, it's part of the culture on every level. They have beekeeping clubs in the elementary schools. There are some schools that actually have bee houses on the property. We'll be visiting one on my, in my September trip. Um, they, I've seen children as young as three years old go on beekeeping day trips. Hmm. So it's, it's very much part of the culture. Every family probably has a beekeeper in it. Hmm. They consume most of the honey that they produce. Very little of it is, is exported out of the country wow. because there's such big consumers of their honey. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's really a, a nice, it's just wonderful to visit all of them. And what do they do? Like, um, do they have d dishes that we've never heard of that they, you know, would be, I mean, what do they do with the honey? What, what are kind of, what is their creative ways of, of cooking? Or uh, well, they all do something with the honey liqueur. Mm -hmm. They all, they use, they also will, will put it on bread. The, the typical, uh, an old time breakfast, they do a honey breakfast in the elementary schools the third week of November. And the local beekeepers will come into this classrooms and they will, they will have honey and they will have apple and they will have bread and that's their breakfast. Mm -hmm. So the honey goes on the bread. So they've been doing that for quite a while. Okay, interesting. Um, and, and with regards to like, um, you know, do they do things with the wax and what about other bee products as a result? Oh yes, they, they, uh, many people will make the wax candles. Um, they also, um, they also make, um, I was trying to think of, uh, one of the places that we go to is um, a center for adult mentally handicapped people. And they are also beekeepers there too. And so they make, they make their own honey for themselves. And they also do a lot of crafts and things where they'll, they'll use honey or do things with that will show bees mm. or the bee houses, that type of thing. I do have a, I do have a cookbook on, on honey recipes from Slovenia. I just haven't done anything with it yet. Mm -hmm. Interesting, wow. Well, I'm wondering if anybody else has any questions. I've been asking a few. I, I just love, I, I think it's fascinating. Uh, but you can certainly you know, write some questions in the chat line. Someone um, asked, um, is the, do you make mead? Uh, I personally do not make mead. I have a what, neighbor. What is, what is mead? <laughs> mead is fermented honey in water. Okay. And it takes a year. Oh, that's, isn't that a traditional New Hampshire dish? I think it's, I think mead, mead has been around for, an incredibly long, it's, it's one of the oldest, um, uh, it's one of the oldest things that, that was ever fermented from the huh. beginning was mead. And the, the term honeymoon comes from the fact that when people would go on their honeymoon, they were given mead so that they would start their, their marriage life happy. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Suzanne, as you're talking, could you kind of just um, click backwards to the slideshow because then one woman came a little bit late and she wanted to see a little bit more of the slides. So sure. she sort of didn't catch it to the end. Um, do okay. other people have um, some new questions at all or different questions? I, I, um, I certainly have a few more, but I'd be happy to listen to what other people have to say. Her, her, I, I bought some of those panels, which are lovely. Um, uh, what, oh, now that, the I meant to put that in there. That's what's the, I, um, one question person asks is, what's the average cost of the equipment you use in the comparison to the 
Langstroth hives? Uh, it's more expensive because you have to have a building or a stand. You have, these hives are not meant to be out in the open like Langstroth hives are. So they have to be under cover. So you do have the cost of the building, but once, once you build it, you're gonna have it for the rest of the time you're a beekeeper. And, and you can do beekeeping with this style of hives, even when you're, you know, 70s, 80s and 90s, if, if you want to, the Langstroth, you would not be able to, to continue doing that mm -hmm. because, because of the, the weight of the, of the boxes. But yeah, I, I meant to put that picture of the, of the bee panels in there. I do have a whole bunch of them though. So I'm ready for you and I'm ready for you in May, Lauren. So um, those little panels, I mean, do they have, each one has any significance? I mean, are they just sort of typical folklore? Or, you know, those, those illustrations? They're, they're folklore, they're also political. They're also oh. historical, religious. Um, they talk about the life. There are some that are joking. There's one that shows a man bringing this old haggard woman to a factory and he pulls out a young, beautiful woman on the other side. So basically he took his wife, tossed her in and got a young one on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should do that for the men. Yeah. I thought your garden great. Excellent. Yeah, this, the, the yellow here is the St. John's wart. And I've got I have I've got blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, grapes, um, eleven raised beds full of vegetables, of course. And so the um, the bees have plenty to 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 feast on here. Now, I mean, you know, considering bees are really considered endangered, and it's I know I know there's you know been so many articles and so much written about it. Is the Sylvania people doing anything in terms of protection or are they are they are they involved with a bit more you know niche climate control regarding bees or you know because it's very obviously very concerning when you can yeah. pay attention to the news well luckily the eu has banned the worst neonicotinoid chemicals and so um their, their bees are actually starting to rebound hmm. sorry about that um, so I'm ask, how large does the hive house have to be? Are the frames different size than the Langstroth? I don't know what Langstroth is. Maybe you can describe the, it. The Langstroths are longer and shorter. Okay. And the uh, the Slovenian ones, they are different size. Um, you can't use a Langstroth frame in, 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 in mine, the ones that I sell. The ones that I sell are the traditional ones from Slovenia. Mm -hmm. I have not altered them. I've not Americanized them or done anything else different to them. Um, all my equipment comes from Slovenia, so I know that it's it's made the proper way. Um, I know there are a lot of people that are making their own versions of them, and I I I hear constantly about issues with them. But mm -hmm. it's uh, up to I guess people's choice what they want to buy. But, so what what is bee tourism? So so bee tourism actually is a fairly new thing in Slovenia. Uh, I think it started maybe about, well, I've been doing it for, for since 2014, so it's at least that old. But basically, because they have so many beekeepers in Slovenia, they decided that, that they want to share this. They want other people to see it. So they started with, so uh, let, let me tell you this. So Slovenia is the size of New Hampshire as far as um, land mass. New Hampshire has maybe 2,000 beekeepers. Slovenia has over 10,000 beekeepers. So I'm never gonna run out of beekeepers to visit doing my tours because it's impossible. So when you go to visit a beekeeper, you go into their bee house, you can ask all the questions you want. They'll go into the hives, they'll explain how they do things. Um, and you'll see very much how different each person manages their bees and what they do different with their bee houses. Some of them are designed for school children to come. So they have a, a big plexiglass up so that, so that they can't, uh, the bees cannot bother the school children, but yet the beekeeper can explain to them what he's doing as he's going through the hive. Other ones are used for tourism with sleeping with the bees. Um, there's a new yeah. one in the area where I used to live. So, on my tours, we visit 12 to 14 beekeepers within two weeks. 
But we also do a lot of other things. We do adventure sports, we do um, wine tasting, we go into caves and castles, we might spend the day in Venice, uh, go down to the coast in uh, Piedon in Slovenia, spend the day just on the coast. So it's a little bit of everything, but it is a beekeeping tour. So um, you will leave with a lot more knowledge than what you arrived on, for sure. Sounds like we're going to have to put together a beat biking and biking and beekeeping. <gasps> oh, that, like, that would be great. awesome. Sounds like it'd be a really cool way to design a trip. Is to that go. would be a really good idea. Yeah, and then you know you have you know you have a little a little alliteration as well. You know, biking and beekeeping. So I like yeah. that. Yeah, um, well, that would be easy enough to do in Slovenia. There's there's beekeepers everywhere. We have a tour. I mean, we have a tour in Slovenia. And I think we talked about that where our tour is, but um, yes, that we could easily modify the trip that we already do. I think it'd be really. Well, I think I'm, I'm meeting you there in September. Yeah, I hope so. I know. Now, when, <laughs> when, when one sleeps with the bees. What, what, what is it? Do you just, you know, is, is the buzzing sound that people like, or, or, you know, what's, what, what does that it's, mean? It's a combination of things. It's the, it's the buzzing sound. Let's see if I have that. There it is. That's the bed. That's above the, above the hives. Um, it's, it's the, that white noise sound all night long, but it's also the smell. When huh. you walk into my bee house now, the smell is intoxicating. You're smelling honey and, and pollen and propolis and, and it's just, it's just such a wonderful smell in there. I, I walk in every day and if I don't have something to do, huh. just because I enjoy being in there. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Great. Um, so if, if anybody's interested, uh, if, if of course everything continues to go better, um, I've had to cancel three tours already, but my next tour is nine to 24 September. And I have, I thought I put it on here. Um, my, I think it's at the end. We'll be sending out the links to, um, and I put yeah. it also um, up to everything to your to your, to your website, and okay. so we'll be able to see it. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you're interested, you can you can you can email me, and I will send you the um, the, the tour itinerary. It is not on my website yet. Um, and my, Michael asks, what is um, what is propolis? Propolis. Propolis. Propolis is is. Kind of what we call bee glue. It's what the bees use to seal up holes in their hive so it's more airtight. It's also it sanitizes the hive. Hmm. And I've been in touch with a beekeeper from Algeria, and he told me that uh, he puts propolis and olive oil and marinates it in there for a couple of weeks, and then he takes a couple of teaspoons a day. And he said, "You if you take that, he goes, it'd be very difficult to get sick." because there's so much good stuff in there. Hmm. I've actually had my mother on it for a year to keep her COVID free. Hmm. So well, yeah, is, you, were, you, were talking, you were talking uh, when we were there, you were talking about the, the healing qualities of bees and the, it, um, the antibiotic um, you know, quality of honey rather. Um, could you speak a little bit about of that? Well, what's interesting is if you, if you were to go to the pyramids and find honey, it's still edible. Honey does not go bad. Hmm. unless it has too much water content in it but honey, honey honey will last forever and it's antibacterial it's antifungal it's antimicrobial it's it's anti everything so it's used in many different ways for for wounds it's also good for colds and sore throats it's also good just for health if you take a teaspoon before you go to bed at night it will help you for sleeping hmm. I have several of my friends in Slovenia. This is they they will take they will take honey at night before they go to bed, and hmm. it's better not to put honey into, you know, hot coffee or hot tea because it does destroy some of the health benefits of it. Hmm. What is one of the, the the ingredients of honey that is the most curative? Oh gosh, um, huh? Or maybe it's, I, it's just the whole batch of stuff. Yeah, I think it's a, it's 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 a combination of everything, because it, it's it's a, it's a food. It's basically a food that contains everything in it that you could live off of. You could survive with honey and pollen. Hmm. Pollen is also another. Um, in September, we'll be visiting um, the man I call the pollen guy, and he actually brought his his himself back from the brink of death with just doing with adding pollen to his diet because his doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Hmm. And it's quite amazing stuff, but I do have, it may only be me. I'm the only one I've ever met that's had this problem, but 
if you do get pollen, you make sure you get it frozen and also just one or two granules to see if you get a reaction. Hmm. You have to build yourself up to it. Someone asked, uh, says, uh, looks like there are two different types of hives in your bee house. Those in the middle look smaller. Can you explain? Those are nukes. So those are just seven frames and the other ones are 10 frames over 10 frames. The nukes I use, I use, I actually even overwinter in them. Uh, and, and also Langstroth beekeepers overwinter in nukes. Nukes just means a nucleus. It, it's, a, it's a smaller version of the regular hive. And it, like I said, these, these particular ones have seven frames. I also sell ones that have five frames. And it's just, it's a great way to start a hive because it's a smaller space. Sometimes with the new queen, they don't like all that big space of a regular hive. Uh, if you go to bee meetings, sometimes they have the raffles and you win queens. So I'll bring the queens home. I'll pull some frames of brood from some of my other hives and start a new family in the nukes. Hmm. Or if I have a hive that's very small and weak, I will move them into one of the nukes because it's a smaller space for them to have to maintain. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hmm. So we have some um, additional questions from anyone. World Bee Day is May 20th. That's exciting. <laughs> Coming up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to include that on my tours, but not, we're not uh -huh. going to be over there this year. I know. But yeah, that actually was in, that actually became possible because of the Slovenian Beekeepers Association. Hmm. So out of over 10,000 beekeepers, eight, over 8,000 of them belong to the Beekeepers Association. Hmm. And they're the ones that, that, that put in the proposal to make World Bee Day May 20th. And the reason it is on May 20th is because it is the, the man, Anton Schneiderschnitz, who is the developer of these hives. Hmm. No, I'm sorry. That's not, that's not correct. Um, no, that's not correct. I, get, I gave, gave you the wrong name. I'll have to think of it. Right. But it was, yeah. Anton Janza, he is the one that went to the Austrian court and his birthday is May 20th. So oh, okay. he's the reason why it's on May 20th. Oh, okay. Interesting. Sorry Great. about the long name there. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> anybody else have any, any other questions? Any additional questions? I mean, this little, if you haven't been to Harrisville, um, it's really a very special place as Suzanne um, said and showed. I mean, the architecture is beautiful. I mean, Another wonderful air thing about this area and, you know, on our tours is I call it the, you know, there's the Lake District of, of New Hampshire, which is you know, Lake Winnipesaukee. That's the classic Lakes District. But um, there's a lot of lakes in Southern New Hampshire and many of them are right around Harrisville. I, I, there, I, there are nine within 10 minutes of my house. Nine, nine lakes and ponds within 10 minutes. Yeah, so it's great. And we cycle along, like one of the, our route that when we arrive to your place and when we leave, we're really zigzagging along all these lovely lakes. And um, it's very special. It's a very special area. I used to go to Harrisville, the Contra Dance. Um, and it's just a, it's a, it's a, just a lovely little town, very sleepy. The roads are really quiet. Um, you know, considering it, it actually is such a special town and, and with such wonderful architecture, it's surprising that it, there really are so few, few people there. I mean, it really hasn't, hasn't blown up with tourism, um, which is nice. It's just such it a does in the summertime with the summer people, but normally there's less than a thousand people that are here. And you're, we're close to Mount Monadnock. So if you're not familiar again with this area, this is part of the Monadnock region. And it, again, it's the sort of quiet corner of Southern New Hampshire and Monadnock, Mount Monadnock, the second most climbed mountain in the world is, I don't know, half an hour from Harrisville. And mm -hmm. again, another on our trip, our first day, we go to Swansea, our second day, we go to Harrisville, Walpole, um, and then Lake Spofford. And then the last day we actually go um, and climb Mount Monadnock. So a lot of special things to see in this area, really. It's, um, it's quite, quite special um, in the historically very, in addition to the agriculture and small farms and, and artists. I mean, there's a lot of historical, very fascinating, you know, historical aspects of the area. One of the people on this call right now is Evelyn Leppard. If you look down to her, you'll see her bee house. Oh, okay. She's in Ohio and she's bought her products for me. And oh. she has been up here. She's, she came up to visit me. She drove up one time and came up and spent the night. And uh, when I had my open, my Slovenian open um, bee house day in New Hampshire, which oh. will be the last Saturday of July. 
So I have it not, was that, a great time. I've not put that, isn't that nice? <laughs> yes, it was wonderful. Very yeah. colorful. <laughs> You want to unmute yourself and either you could either ask a question in the chat or say hello to Suzanne. It's fine with fine with us. Um, and um, again, I'll be sending out an I'll be sending out an email tomorrow with all the links that I shared today in the chat and a link to this tour. Um, we have a Memorial Day weekend tour coming up, and we we're offering one hundred fifty dollars off that tour because it's early season and we want to get a, a fresh start to the season. So um, would love to, and I'll be I'll be guiding all of the. Um, the trips in New Hampshire, we'll be seeing Suzanne and a lot of other, a lot. we're going to the Burdick, Burdick Chocolate Factory in, in Walpole, we're going to a vineyard um, in, in, in Westmoreland, so um, Southern, Southern New Hampshire from a foodie point of view is, is really, you know, bursting at the seams. And of course, if you have never been to Keene, it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful town. It's a lot more, a little more fascinating than we were growing up there, Suzanne, right? Yes, oh, definitely. Yeah. Completely yeah. different than when I moved here. So Definitely. I will, you know, I'll include the links to that. Um, if anybody has any, just you can chat, you can, you know, type some questions if you'd like. Um, happy, happy to talk to you some more. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm just responding one of the questions here. Yeah, and one, one thing about Keen that has recently been, um, last couple of years, they added these beautiful murals. Um, so there's 16 historic murals in Keen. Um, again, if you haven't been, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it's only an hour and a half from Boston. Um, so it's really very accessible, you know, close to home destination, at least for those of us in the East Coast. Well, great. Um, Suzanne, did you want to say anything else about um, your tours, um, Harrisville? Um, no, it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much open for people to come whenever. Just let me know. I, right now, currently, I'm working four nights a week. I do elder home care, so my days are free. And I now finally have regained my weekends after three years. So I'm around Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I'm more than happy to, to give you a tour of my apiary and, and give you a little bit more information on beekeeping if you're interested in that. But also you can also pop down and have lunch over at Harrisville. And maybe, you know, just a couple of things from, I mean, I mean, we all, you know, I'm assuming most of us on the call are environmentalists and concerned about the environment, but maybe you can just as a reminder, um, share a couple of things that we can do to, you know, take care of bees and protect the protect the environment for the future of bees. I'm, it's, I've always, it's very concerning to me what's, what's going on. I know, on. It is, it's, it's very concerning. Uh, probably the, one of the main things would be is that just do not spray stuff on your, on your, in your gardens. Bees, bees will fly to three to four miles away so you don't know where your local bee, beekeeper is and they may be coming to your garden. So I wouldn't spray them. Leave the dandelions alone. Uh, bees love weeds. So that's another good thing. Plant things that bees like. You can look, you can Google it for your area to see what they like and just start planting things for them. And bees will, gen, honeybees will leave you alone. It's not that I, I get stung all the time, but of course I'm going into them. But <laughs> bees will leave you alone if you just stay out of their space. Mm -hmm. um, don't swat at them. Don't kick at them. Um, if you're just walking around. They're, they're going to leave you alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, um, and and you just said you could literally Google what to grow if, if you want to have attract bees, that kind of yes. thing. Yes, yes. And then anything sort of generic that you can plant, or, or it, it pretty much doesn't matter. Uh, there's there's a huge list for every area in the United yeah. States. So I would say just Google what's in your area, or go to your local nursery and ask them what they have for bee friendly plants. Great, great. Yeah. Well, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and say hi to Suzanne, if you if you know her and haven't had a chance to talk, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and we'll just sort of, sort of begin to say goodbye again. Next week, we're going to be going to Puglia, which is the heel of Italy. And uh, we're oh. going to have Regina and Michael as our hosts. And then uh, the following week, we're going to have uh, Richard Fries. And then coming up is again, Marcello and uh, Sandro, who are going to talk about gravel bicycling and um, we're adding a couple more things. We might, might sort of wind down a little bit over the summer because we've got tours going on and um, we'll be, you know, busy on tours. But, you know, again, um, take a look at our, if you're interested in any of the bicycle tours, I'm happy to chat with anybody. If you're new to cycling, I'm happy to talk with you about it um, because we, you know, it's, we're, we're very welcoming, inviting to all kinds of cyclists on our trips. And no, no speed required. It's all at your own pace. <laughs> we stay in lovely accommodations and, and, and eat lots of good food and visit fascinating people like Suzanne. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Thank you. I look forward to your next trip. I know. Well, 